So my name is Dimitri. I'm aware I only have about 20 minutes to talk here, so I won't waste too much time on introductions. Um, this is enforced isolation deep networks for anomaly detection and images. It's quite a mouthful. So I'd like to begin this presentation by um, asking the question of what is anomaly detection? And it's actually something quite difficult to define, but uh, the best, an excellent way to define it is, it is a task of detecting rare patterns which deviate beyond the normal distribution of data. And when we say normal distribution, we don't mean it in the statistical sense, we mean what is considered to be normal. And in the visual example you'll have there, you see the green dots would represent norm, uh, what were normal samples and the red dots would represent anomalies. Now, another part of the definition would be that uh, it's, it's important to note that anomalies are rare. So you should only have very few anomalies compared to normal samples. Otherwise, if you have plenty of anomalies, they would be considered normal. And lastly, and this, this, is, uh, this is something that's also not necessarily part of the definition, but very important to consider, is that anomalies are often benchmarked by human intuition. As in, uh, in many examples, for example, in the images there, um, you'll see that most of these images are seem mostly normal, except for the small spaces, small parts where you would have anomalies. And quite often it's a human that would determine what is anomalous and what isn't. Even if there is something else that's a little off or different from what's normal, a human is what would ultimately decide, yeah, there's something wrong here. Now, there's a reason I'm mentioning these three parts of the definition because we're gonna address most of these things, or not most, all three of these things at some point. But first I'd also like to talk about some of the practical applications of having uh, a method or piece of software that can detect anomalies. And one that's very common and very popular would be uh, predicting anomalies within the stock market within a time series. If the finance industry was able to predict anomalies that occurred within the stock market that are relevant anomalies, they would know where to invest or maybe to stop investing in a particular industry. Um, there's also a lot of application in image anomaly detection for the very example I had that demonstrated to the right, where if you have, um, if you have fact a factory production line and you have some products that might be uh, damaged or defected, you would like to remove them from that production line. And getting a human to look at each item that goes by is very laborious for a very laborious and exhausting, but having a machine that could do it automatically and recognize any form of anomaly without defining what the anomaly is would be something that would save, um, well, any factory a lot of money. And video anomaly detection can play a very valuable role at some point for the safety of the public because Throughout all the CCTV, but all the CCTV cameras you have around a city, there is only most of the most of the footage is normal, and we're only looking for a few precious seconds of an anomaly. And getting a human to sit there and watch several hours is not particularly helpful to find it. But if you had a piece of software that could detect this precious seconds and could watch it at all times, something that could detect an anomaly happens could alert the authorities and provide a quicker response time. So. Let's talk about some of the challenges in anomaly detection. Um, now, for the most part, I think one would assume that this is a supervised learning problem, even though it's not a popular approach, and I'm going to explain why, because you would assume that if, you're, if you have anomaly detection, you either want to detect whether it's normal or anomalous, and so therefore it's supervised. However, that's not necessarily the case. One of the reasons being we have heavily unbalanced data. And to demonstrate this as an example, let's say our normal samples are horses, and we have some anomalous samples of, say, cats and dogs. If we were to put, oh, and let's say the split is 95.5%. So 95% of our data is normal samples, and we have 5% to be anomalous, which is quite common what you'd, commonly what you'd find. If we were to put this through a classic classification model, you would expect that if the model were to predict every result to be normal, it would be correct 95% of the time, because let's face it, no matter what you put in there, it's predicting it to be normal. But when you put something else in there that say isn't an anomaly, that is an anomaly, we don't want it to predict something that's normal. It's not about how frequently it's right because what we're ultimately looking for are those 5% of anomalies. We need a model that can detect those rare patterns regardless of how frequently it's right. Another issue is that there is no explicit definition of an anomaly. So let's say we actually did have a 50-50 data split and we did have a model that predicts normal and anomalous data. Um, when, a model, when the model receives something it's never seen before, it may just predict it to be normal when it's actually a human could tell you that is an anomaly. So this goes back to there is no explicit definition of an anomaly because we don't want to look for specific anomalies. We want an anomaly detection model to predict, to detect 
any anomaly, whether we've explained to it what it might is or, or not. So a more popular approach is often the unsupervised learning approach. And I'm going to give you an overview of the, for lack of a better word, theory or context of how unsupervised learning approaches often work. And often they do, quite often you handle uh, anomaly detection and unsupervised learning approach with just normal training samples. So you would take your normal data and what you would attempt to do is assign say an anomaly score near the, well, for the entire vector space of your normal samples, where the idea in this two dimensional space here is the darker the blue, the more normal it is, and the further away you get from that distribution, the more anomalous your, uh, your sample has become. And the way you would, and the, so once you have this normality score, the way you would test it is not with an accuracy. You would uh, actually use an area under curve. And I'm going to go into some detail explaining what that is and why that's useful. So during testing time, you would apply the ground truth of normal or anom anom and anomalous samples that we have. And once you, once you can see over there, the anomalies are the red ones and the green ones are the normal samples that mostly overlap. And what you would do is for each of these anomaly scores, you would try different thresholds. And from these th different thresholds, that would allow you to get a false positive and true positive rate and ultimately an area under curve. So area under cur curve ultimately, ultimately measures is how how, about, how correct can this anomaly score be, this normality score be, uh, given different thresholds? And there will be an optimal threshold that you could choose. In this case, it would be this. And that's how, you, that's how unsupervised learning normal approaches tend to work. However, it works in classic machine learning, this works just fine, but in classic machine learning, um, but well, it's something a little more complicated than in classic machine learning, everything falls into a vector space, but there are more complicated examples where things do not fall into a normal vector space. Say, for example, image anomaly detection, where normal samples and anomalous samples can be quite convoluted, for lack of a better term. And when you were, if you were to view these in a two-dimensional space, you would quite often find anomalous samples, the blue samples, overlapping the normal samples, making it incredibly difficult to tell what's anomalous and what's normal. So. We decided to ask ourselves, given only a small fraction of anomalous samples with respect to normal samples, could we design a model which distinctly maps anomalous samples far from normal samples? Um, and that's precisely what we attempted to do with Aiden, well, with, the, with the model we came up with, the method we came up here. And the method I'd like to introduce to you is enforced isolation deep network or Aiden's methodology. So I'm going to begin with a bit of math just to get the basic definitions out of the way. We're going to define some data set D that's comprised of X and X hat, normal and anomalous samples respectively. And all the classic definitions apply where X and X hat share no elements. There are more normal samples and anomalous samples. And just to define it, let's say that X and X hat are in an RK space. Um, I can hear some noise in the background. If somebody can mute their microphone, I think that's Edwin. Um, I don't think Edwin can hear us. <laughs> so let's next define the neural network S that we're going to design, which will map S from the RK space to an RL space where K is much larger than L. L is a lower dimensional space. The actual neural network we use is this one here, which takes in an image and reduces it to a two dimensional space using dense layers. And the way we ended up tackling this by mapping normal samples to be near each other and anomalous samples to be far is by using an augmented form of the triplet loss function, where the idea is the anchor and positive values will be near each other and the anchor and negative values will be far apart. Now, this doesn't necessarily solve the challenge of unbalanced data, and this is something else we needed to address. So I'm going to take a step away from this part to discuss a way that we decide to handle the unbalanced data. Uh, well, yeah, how do we solve the problem of unbalanced data? So the way we decided to tackle this was to look at our data sets and think of a way to best maximize the value of them. So let's take them, let's say we have our normal samples of X, which is comprised of X1, X2, X3, up to XQ samples. And our normal samples are X hat one, X hat two, X hat three, up to X hat R samples, where Q is larger than R. We defined a function G of, X, G of X, X hat, which is our random triplet sampler, where g of x would take a would create a a set of uh, vectors 
the y, which would, which would randomly choose between the zero vector, and the zero vector would be the origin, and the one vector, which would be, which would be the vector where every, where every dimension is at one. So let's say we create m samples of these. Once we had our y, y set, we would look at, we would create a positive and negative set, where we would look at the first value of x uh, of y, and if it was a zero vector, it would randomly sample from the normal samples for the positive, and for the negative, it would randomly sample from the net, from the anomalous samples. And if the y value was the one vector, the positive value would randomly sample from the anomalous samples, and the negative value would randomly sample from the um, from the uh, normal samples. And we did that, of course, and we did that for the, we populated the entire positive and negative, and of course there were m, m samples. Now that sounds like quite a mouthful. It's quite com quite quite complicated to recognize that way. But a more formal definition would be we defined a function g of x x hat, which randomly samples m triplets from the data sets, satisfying the below criteria. It would randomly pick y value between which would be either the zero vector or one vector in the, the l dimensional space in the lower dimensional space, and it would randomly sample uh, values of p uh, positive and negative samples for, with respect to what the y value would be. So once we had that, we had a way of addressing the unbalanced data. And again, this all looks quite complicated and convoluted, but a nice neat way to recognize it is in this little graph here, where G will spit out random samples, um, well, random samples, it will spit out random triplets, where the positive and negative value will be passed through the neural network, and then we put into the triplet loss function so that the positive and Y values will be mapped near each other, and the negative and Y values will be mapped far apart. Now, if you look at our neural network here, I designed it this way specifically, as in to, do, to reduce to a two-dimensional space, so that it was a little more, so that we could observe this a little more visually. So, in a in, a, in an actual example that we have, we I, I observed. I think this was the MNIST data set. I don't remember which sample. But when the when this when the front, when the neural network F has been trained at zero epochs, you'll see that there's overlap between normal and anomalous samples. After only four epochs, you could see that the anomalous samples, the blue samples, are, are starting to attain some distance from the normal samples. And with quite a few more epochs, it seems to really map them far apart. So this way you have some distinction between normal and anomalous samples. And that's the logic we wanted to provide. Even though we didn't have many anomalous samples, we want to train our neural network to recognize that we have the normal samples in their space, and there needs to be some distinction between the normal samples and any particular anomalous sample. So, Let's look at some of the experiments and results we conducted here. Um, the first set of results I want to look at are the MNIST data set, where to the far right here we have Aiden at 0 0.01, which means we use 1% of anomalous samples uh, with respect to normal samples. So for every 100 normal samples, we had one anomalous sample. And the reason we chose 1% in this case is because OCNN uses 1% of anomalous samples with respect to normal samples. And we, want to, we wanted this to be a fair comparison. And we actually do outperform, not by much, uh, OCNN's results. And we certainly outperform all the unsupervised learning methods results only using 1%. However, as we did expect, we did not outperform the supervised learning methods because they are using 100% of anomalous samples with respect to normal samples for the MNIST data set. And you'll see something similar for CIFAR-10, where we outperform OCNN and the unsupervised learning methods, although OCNN at this point uses 10%, and so do we. However, we did not outperform the supervised learning methods, as you would expect, but still, only using 10% of data, we managed to outperform all the other methods. And you see, the same, you see something similar with uh, the concrete cracks data set, where we outperform the unsupervised learning method to anomaly, but the supervised learning methods and Aiden, um, it's a little hard to, it, it doesn't outperform them, but it does pretty well to compete with them because there is, it's very difficult to compete with 99.9% .9 AUC, but still competitive results. Again, though, this can all look quite convoluted. It's quite, it, you, it's really hard to attain a, to, to recognize a value from these tables. So we decided to provide you with a graphical representation of the performance and uh, not to intimidate you too much with too many bullet points, but I'm gonna go through it. So everything in this line means that we use 100% of anomalous samples with respect to normal samples. And this is where you'll find all your supervised learning methods. 
um, at zero percent is where we used no normal, no anomalous samples with respect to normal samples. So trained only on normal data. And this is where you'll find your completely unsupervised learning methods. You'll find OCNN over here where you have 1% to 10% respectively. Uh, well, for MNIST and Cypher 10. And the blue line is IDEN's mean score. So, or AIDEN, however, I just like to pronounce this thing. <laughs> um, where we decide to try to try our method using different types of percentages and see how it compares against the competitors. And you can see that even at 1%, AIDEN does pretty well comparing with all unsupervised learning methods. And as we mar marginally increase the number of anomalous samples, we can see that it even does pretty well against the supervised learning methods. Now, a question I, a point I addressed earlier in this presentation was, yes, um, we want to know how, yes, it does well against the competitors, even though even with small samples of data, uh, of anomalous data, but how does it fend against samples that have never seen before? Because even though you have fewer samples in your testing, fewer samples, all, all the samples that are in your testing data also exist in your training data. So we decided to address that exact problem where we train an Aiden model only using the anomalous classes one, two, three, four, five, and assuming zero is the normal class and tested it on the anomalous classes six, seven, eight, nine, which the model had never seen before. They had never seen those anomalous classes. We want to see how it would predict for that. And it did fairly well. Just scoring on anomalous classes that never seen before, it managed to score a 99.45% AUC. Now, another criticism one can apply is that this is quite similar to a dimensional to the process of dimensional reduction, where um, frankly, you, all we're doing is reducing the dimensions and we could see that there's a split that way. So we decided to compare it against two popular dimensional reduction methods, PCA and PSNA. And a fair a way we decide would be a fair way to compare it would be the distance between the anomalous samples and the normal sample cluster centers, where those red dots you see there in the graphs would be where the center is for the, for the normal samples. And we want to test, see what the average distance was between the anomalous samples and the normal samples. And you'll see for IDEN in the training, the, um, we managed to get a distance from the, uh, from the cluster, normal samples cluster center of 1.16. It's a little bit less than that for the testing but it's still much more than PCA and TSNA. So Aiden seems to put a greater distance between normal and anomalous samples than PCA and TSNA, which is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to associate some distance between normal and anomalous samples. So I think I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm going to start concluding here. So what have we done? We trained Aiden in neural network to distinctly map anomalies far from normal samples using an augmented triple loss function. So we provided an augmented triple loss function ultimately. We devised a function g of x, a random triplet sampler with, to handle unbalanced data. We applied Aiden to three different data sets, the MNIST, CIFAR 10, and Concrete Cracks. Attained, uh, scores, uh, attained better scores against all unsupervised learning methods and some scores keep of competing with supervised learning methods. Where we're, well, we're using only a fraction of the anomalous sample, I think it's important to mention that. And we also demonstrate that the method is capable of distinguishing never before seen anomalies during testing. Um, at this point, I think I'm open to ask if anybody has any questions. Am I audible? <laughs> yes. All right. Have some questions? Yes. I put the microphone in. Um, how do I see the questions? How do I actually see the questions here? There we go, chat. Uh, in the chat, it says uh, Sergio Belastin asking. Uh, in, ah, in, I see in an MNIST. What are, yeah, MNIST. What are my anomalous samples? So it's a one versus the rest approach. So we tried it for each one of them. So if the normal class was five, Every other class would be considered anomalous. Zero to four and six to nine would be considered anomalous samples when five would be the normal class. It was always a one versus the rest approach. And that's what we did for each of them. When you look at the graph, and then, well, hold on, let me go back here for my slide. Uh, where's my mouse? I've lost my mouse. Da, da. So in the graph there, uh, at the bottom, at the, at the, in the line there, where you see the scores in a line, those are the mean scores. But if you look at the tables, if you go back to the tables, 
we actually have a score for each of the classifications. Does that answer the question? I think that. Oh. Yes. It says. Right. Um, any other questions? Well, thank you, Demetris. Thank uh, you.